All right, we've covered drums, we've covered bass. Today we're gonna to take a deep dive into the guitar recording setup for the new Cattle Decapitation album, Death Atlas. Okay, we got a ton of ground to cover, so let's just dig right in. We'll start with the instruments for you guitar dorks out there. Josh's guitar is probably one of the most interesting instruments I've ever seen in my life. It is a Cardinal Instruments Copper Top East. The entire top of the actual guitar is copper, which means it has a natural patina from all of the sweat and blood and Travis loogies that have been sprayed on it over the years and gives it a really cool look. We used this guitar for the last album as well, so I already knew it sounded great. I think we maybe tried one of his other instruments, but this one kind of won out. It just has a sound that literally just jumps right through the speakers. It's super aggressive sounding and hooks forward with just tons of tone. It has a bolt-on ribbon mahogany neck, and the body is that ribbon mahogany as well, with a rosewood fretboard. It has a Goto Wilkinson bridge and Sir Aldrich pickups, a match set for the neck and bridge. I have never even heard of any of these companies, and that's typical of the kind of gear that Josh likes. Uh, he definitely doesn't want to be playing the same guitar as anyone else in the entire extreme metal world, So, and he's succeeded. <laughs> Bell's guitar isn't quite as out there, but it's badass nevertheless. I think he actually got this guitar like in the studio, like it was shipped to the studio or right before. I can't remember. It's been a few months, um, but it was brand new to him. He put new strings on it, practiced on it while we were tracking drums and then uh, loved it. And we compared it against some of his other instruments and it sounded the best as well. So it is an LTD MH1000. It's the black cherry fade finish. It's a neck through. Uh, and it has a mahogany body and a maple neck and a Madagascar ebony fretboard. Madagascarian? Madagascarian? Madagascar? I don't know. It has a standard Floyd Rose bridge, and it's loaded with a Seymour Duncan Pegasus with coil splitting in the bridge pickup spot and a hot rail in the neck. Typically, if I'm recording an album with two guitarists, we'll pick one instrument for all the rhythms. That just alleviates any issues you might have with intonation, different strings. It's just going to make the tone sound a little closer. Intonation is really the big one. I mean, even if you perfectly intonate two different guitars, they, they may still not play well together uh, across all the frets. You know, maybe you can get them right on open and on the 12, but there could be slight variances that could cause issues. So we did some experimentation with both of the guitars and they actually sounded great together. They definitely don't sound the same, they weren't wildly different and they complemented each other even if i'm only doing two tracks hard pan left and right uh, it didn't throw the balance off we didn't really run into any intonation issues so it definitely helps that they're both great players and all these guitars were set up well and in extremely good condition but i was kind of surprised that they just kind of mash each other so well and we were able to use their individual instruments for rhythm tracks now, some of you may know that I generally prefer Tortex picks. I really like all the Dunlop picks, really, but the Tortex and the Oltex, typically in like a 0.88 kind of range, just sound amazing. Perfect balance of bite and clarity of note definition for rhythm guitars. And I 100% had one in my hand, and I was ready to just slap whatever they came with out of their fingers and just give them this and tell them, no, you have to play with this. But like any good producer or engineer should, we did some ABs, some experimentation. We tried some of the Dava picks that Josh came in with, and to my surprise, they sounded great. For the majority of the rhythm parts, we used a Dava master control pick. It actually has a metal tip. Any other metal pick I've ever used, it just sounded like scratchy trash, and I've just thrown it out immediately. But this thing didn't. It sounded really good. It had a lot of the qualities I like about the Tortex picks as far as that note definition, a lot of attack, balanced attack, a lot of note clarity. On these guitars and on this tone, it was kind of that, you know, bumped up a notch, maybe like that on 120% strength. 
It has a nickel silver tip. I think some of the metal picks I've used in the past have been copper. Maybe that's the difference. I'm not really sure. They didn't really wear down at all, despite finding little metal shavings under the strings and maybe around the pickups. We just used two picks for the whole album as far as rhythms. I think Bill had one and Josh had one, and we probably could have just used one if they wanted to trade back and forth. And it sounded great. I never wore down. They never lost the edge. We did have to be slightly more aware of that technique, especially as far as pick angle. I noticed that if we had too sharp of an angle against a string, it would tend to get scratchy. On some of those parts that might have suffered from that scratchiness more than others, like any kind of fast trim picking or black metal cords that are being shredded, we did use a different pick for some of those spots. That's the Dava Rock Control Delrin Medium. Uh, it helped out. It still had a good amount of bite, uh, but toned down on that scratchiness and uh, more tone would come through rather than just too much aggressive kind of string noise. For some of the auxiliary guitars and I think all of the clean guitars, we also did use the Intune Cattle branded picks, uh, which sounded great for those. I don't really know the specs on them, uh, but they seem to be sort of like a Tortex type material and sounded about as you would expect, um, which was good, nice and balanced. For strings, Josh was using the standard Nickel Wound D Dario XLs. These are probably my favorite string, if only because they're consistent and I know what I'm going to get with them. They're kind of like the SM57. They're just always going to get the job done. Bell, on the other hand, was using a pick that I would have never, ever chosen offhand. Uh, it's an Ernie Ball slinky set, which is fine, but there are the M Steels, and I have always hated steel strings on guitar. I've typically found them to be too bright. They tend to sound kind of spanky through a gain stage, especially with uh, the metal picks we're using and steel strings. I would have imagined this would just sound terrible, but that's the strings he uses and that's what he had on his guitars. And when we tried out guitars, it just sounded awesome. So surprised myself and I, it goes to say that you should always just give everything a shot, especially if it's already set up. You know, you wouldn't want to change something that's already set up without at least trying it first. And these two wildly different guitars with a bizarre pick selection and wildly different strings sound amazing together. I was pretty blown away when I look even now talking about it. I just can't believe how how these two setups sounded so awesome together. For the DI, I once again used my MW1 Creation Audio Labs. I won't go into too much detail because I covered it pretty extensively in the bass video that you can find right up here. It's my favorite DI. It's pretty much what I use always, especially if reamping is gonna be part of the equation just because it's so clean in and out. It just sounds perfectly transparent, recording into a DAW and then back out into an amp using the reamp function. It's just flawless. Now on to the best part, the guitar amps. Josh had recently picked up a custom high watt super high 50. Josh tends to gravitate towards gear that other people aren't using or playing, maybe in efforts to find a unique tone or maybe just cause he's a punk rock motherfucker. But regardless, you don't see anyone else in extreme metal playing one of these amps. Some of that is cause it's new. Some of that is because it's pretty crazy expensive, but I still think that's about to change. I think you're going to start seeing more of these because they really sound great. The Super High 50 is based on a traditional high watt amp design, but with a mod by Mike Fortin, which gives it that extra gain boost and kind of brings it into that more metal arena. It has four gain stages with a boost on, which we had the boost on for all of the rhythms, and is an extremely percussive and tight sounding amp. We didn't use any tube screamer or any kind of boost up front just guitar straight into the head, and it had as much punch and clarity and definition as you could possibly want out of an amp. After tracking and as I was getting into the mix, I did feel the need to blend in a tone with a little more saturation, a little bit more of a modern kind of shape. So I did reamp through the 6505 and we just blended that in. They're probably about even in the mix, honestly. And the 6505 definitely saturates more has a little bit of a of a wider spectrum, like it goes a little bit deeper and has a little bit crispier highs where the slightly more vintage tone of the high watt just kind of fills in those mids and gives you a bunch of clarity and tone straight down the middle uh, while you kind of get some squishiness and saturation from the 6505. Uh, we did use a boost with the 6505. It was my Keeley modded TS9DX, uh, which I really like. It wasn't necessary to, to tighten up the 6505 and to find that sweet point between um, punch and definition and the saturation we needed. 
I've actually used this same amp on every cattle album I've ever done, which uh, now would be the last three, including Death Atlas. And it's kind of just had something that resonates with the cattle sound to me. So I may end up just squeezing it in. Uh, you know, if I continue to work with the band, I'll, I'll, I'll at least get it in somewhere just for prosperity's sake. We're using two cabs, both with a single 57. Uh, the first cab would be my Mesa Oversize that I use uh, almost all the time. I only have a few guitar cabs here and it gets picked, I would probably say nine times out of 10. Sounds great. The voicing on those Mesa V30s is perfect, matches just perfectly with a standard 57. And it's something I'm definitely used to working with. And we also mic'd up the Hiwat cab that they were awesome enough to ship out to the studio specifically for the album. The Hiwat cab has a bit thicker low end, which is pretty impressive because the low end on the Mesa cab's incredible. The two of them blended together, sounded great, and also gave us something a little more unique than just the standard 57 on the Mesa cab. All the mics and the DI were all going through my Crane Song Spider for preamps and conversion. Just does what it's supposed to, sounds great, tends to sound the warmest and best balanced across the spectrum out of the other options I have for preamps. Now, the tones that we're about to dig into do have some processing. It's not raw straight out of the mics, uh, but pretty minimal. Just what I would do for a tracking mix, uh, you know, for everyone to listen to as we're working on the album. So we're talking like a little bit of EQ, some low pass, some high pass, probably a little bit of cutting in the low mids for the boominess and some cutting in the upper mids for that harshness, like three and a half to four and a half K somewhere up there. But nothing major, just a little bit. Let's have Josh and Bell play a bit, dig into the amps, show you what they sound like together as well as individually and with all the other instruments. So this obviously isn't a finished mix, but you can hear how well those tones blend together. The kind of modern saturated aspect of the 6505 with just that punchy mid-range of the high watt just fit seamlessly together like two pieces of a puzzle. I'm really stoked on that, really happy with the guitar tone, just as I am with all the other tones on the album. Everything's just coming together perfectly. Once again, it's a brand new channel and I'd be really stoked if you would subscribe. I'm trying to make videos for you guys whenever I can, whenever I can kind of fit it into the normal studio schedule. We maybe have one more video for the cattle album going over the vocal recording process. And then I'm also gonna get back into making just, you know, traditional videos as far as techniques and tips and plugin reviews and studio workflow stuff. Anything I can think of that, that maybe would help you guys out. So subscribe if you're into it uh, and then you can watch them all. So I hope you enjoy this little peek into the session for guitars. Death Atlas comes out on Black Friday of this year, 2019, and it is an absolute B7 album. I can't wait to share it with you guys. That's it for this one. See you guys next time. Cheers.
Dead or alive.